I would now like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Metter. Dr. Metter is a professor of neurology and neurosciences at Stanford University. He is also the clinical director of Stanford Comprehensive Epilepsy Center. Dr. Metter has many research interests, including pregnancy outcomes in women with epilepsy and their children. He is the multi-PI of the 18-year multi-center NIH will need study. Dr. Metter, I'll now pass it over to you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. We're going to talk today about women and special issues related to women in, with uh, epilepsy. I hope you'll be, uh, enjoy the presentation and we'll have a question session afterwards. Uh, just so you uh, know, these are my financial disclosures. Most of income comes from taking care of patients or from uh, research grants. I do do some consultant work, but all that money goes to a nonprofit called the Epilepsy Consortium. I think it's interesting to think historically about uh, how far we've come so we understand how far we need to go. The first anti-epileptic drug was discovered in the, in the 1850s, if you don't count herbs like some Chinese herbs or marijuana. In the 1950s, a chemical called bromide was discovered and found to be effective for seizure control. But it wasn't until the 1960s that the first reports of malformations came uh, related to anticonvulsant drugs. And these malformations only were discovered when people went to look for them after the uh, thalidomide tragedy in the 1950s. What's interesting is despite the fact that there were no prior reports of malformations or other problems, in the 1950s, there were 18 states in the US that had sterilization laws for people with epilepsy. And it was not until 1980 that the last state in the US uh, repealed the law forbidding people to marry. So there's this concept that uh, some that people with epilepsy can't have normal ch children, and this is far from the truth. There is some increased risk, but we're discovering things that really help reduce this risk and understand it, and the vast majority of women with epilepsy can have healthy babies. So first specific malformation related to a specific anticonvulsant drug was spina bifida in early 1980s. This is a risk that's noted for Valproate or Valproic Acid, or the brand name in the United States is called Depakote or Depakine. Uh, in the 1980s, in addition to malformations, some studies showed that antibiotic drugs might affect behavior in animals from fetal exposure. And it was not until the 2000s, around 2004, 5, to 2010, that we really began to understand differential risk across the different drugs for both malformations and for behavioral cognitive problems. You know, fully over 150 years passed before we got to that point, and we still have a lot to learn. So special issues for women include menstrual cycle abnormalities, bone health. It's more of an issue for women than men to some extent, although it is an issue for men because after menopause, women's bones thin more. And if they start low when they go into menopause, then they'll end up with severely uh, thin bones. There's sexual dysfunction in both men and women. There's reproductive issues and family planning that primarily apply to women and pregnancy and fetal outcomes that prim primarily apply to women. Um, these issues of risk for the anticonvulsant drugs, especially for the bad ones like Valproate, are interestingly, they only affect children of women with epilepsy because it's the fetal exposure. Uh, men with epilepsy, because they're, the uh, exposure before the pregnancy and the fetal growth don't affect the sperm and they don't actually don't affect the women's eggs either. So if a woman's on a bad drug and she switches to a drug with lower risk, then her risk for the pregnancy is related to the lower drug. During the pregnancy, besides just what happens to the baby's outcome, there's issues about seizure risk and blood level changes, uh, complications of the pregnancy and depression, and then some issues about breastfeeding that we'll talk about. We won't talk about all the issues like bone health and sexual dysfunction, but we will talk about a lot of things related to pregnancy today. One interesting problem that we run into with women with epilepsy is a, is a disorder called catamenial epilepsy. It's, it's about a pattern. It's a tendency for the seizures to be related to the menstrual cycle. It happens in about 30 to 40% of women. 
but it doesn't happen every cycle because uh, if you have a cycle when you don't ovulate, then you don't see this pattern. And when with epilepsy, you have an increased risk to have cycles where they don't ovulate. The reason for this pattern appears to be related to the two main female hormones. There's one called estradiol or estrogen, and the other one is called progesterone. Estrogen in, in animal models lowers the seizure thresholds, makes it more, more likely for animals to have a seizure. And progesterone has the opposite effect. And at two times during the menstrual cycle, the estrogen ratio is higher to the progesterone. One is in the middle of the cycle when you ovulate, and the other is right at before and right at the beginning of, of the uh, menses. And so those two times, there is some increased risk uh, for seizures in women. If we're gonna talk about pregnancy, maybe the first thing to talk about is, is about not getting pregnant. So it's important to understand that several of the drugs interact with birth control pills. And I've listed here on the left a variety of drugs that can impact uh, birth control pills and lower their level and therefore lower their effectiveness and the woman might get pregnant. So if you're going to take a birth control pill and you're one of these seizure medicines, it's important to let your uh, gynecologist know so they can increase the dose or, uh, and, or try a different type of contraception. Uh, I, I, my personal recommendation, recommendation to women of the most effective and reversible form of birth control or IEDs with some hormonal component. This, those hormonal components in the IED are not affected by the seizure medicines and they don't affect the seizure medicines. I've noted here the drugs on the right, drugs that have no significant effects on the birth control pills, but I have lamotrigine in yellow because lamotrigine actually is lowered by birth control pills up, up to 50% lower level when you're taking the pill versus the weeks if you're taking the placebo pill. And we can use lamotrigine with birth control pills and we have to adjust it so that the levels remain good both during the active pills and during the placebo pills. Valparate's highlighted because it doesn't affect birth control pills, but it does affect other drugs. Like for example, if someone was on a, a blood thinner, it would affect those kind of blood, several of those blood thinning drugs, but it doesn't affect birth control pills. Dr. Meadows? Yes. I just wanted to say really quickly, um, we had um, one of our attendees request for you to speak slightly louder or a little bit closer to the microphone, okay. if that's possible. I'll try to talk Thank you so much. Because okay, I can't move the microphone. Sorry about that. So here's the clinical dilemma that both physicians and, and women with epilepsy face. Most drugs are generally contradictory contradicted in, in pregnancy, and we try to avoid drugs during pregnancy, for example, alcohol. But most women with epilepsy can't stop their anticonvulsive drugs due to the risk of seizures. So uh, a convulsion could be deadly to both the mother and the child, and or there's injury, there's risk of miscarriage, and loss of their job or loss of their driving privileges, which can really disrupt their life. So we can't just stop the medicine for most women with epilepsy. Uh, just so you know, the seizures that really pose a big risk to the baby are convulsions. The smaller seizures don't. However, if you were to have a smaller seizure, we had loss of awareness, what we used to call complex partial seizures, and now we call um, uh, focal impaired awareness seizures. Of course, if you were in the wrong place like driving a car, that could be very dangerous. I again want to emphasize there's some increased risk for both malformations and cognitive behavioral problems in the babies of women with epilepsy, but the vast majority of the children born to women with epilepsy are normal. This is one of a complication during pregnancy in women with epilepsy that we should never see now, but there are some drugs like the enzyme inducing drugs, the ones that the same ones that affected the birth control pills can also uh, affect vitamin K and this can increase the risk for bleeding in the baby after birth. This is completely preventable by giving an injection of vitamin K to the baby at birth. And this should, should be done routinely in every baby, irrespective of whether the woman's taking an enzyme-inducing seizure medicine. Uh, all babies should get this. But unfortunately, I had then uh, the experience of seeing a woman with a 
OB in a country hospital forgot to give the baby the vitamin K and then the baby had a severe hemorrhage. And uh, many of these babies die and most of them end up with, with severe neurological problems from the hemorrhage. So if you're taking one of those enzyme inducing drugs, I always encourage my women to ask, remind the OB that baby's gonna need that vitamin K. They'll probably tell you, yes, we know that. You don't need to tell us that, but that's okay. Better safe than sorry is how I feel about having having seen a woman suffer this problem. We have changes in the blood levels during pregnancy. And as you can imagine, if your blood levels drop low enough, then your risk for seizures go up. And there's several reasons for this. One is a thing called reason non-compliance. It's when the woman gets finds out she's pregnant, and she's worried the medicine's hurting the baby, so she stops the medicine, and this could be catastrophic because then the, the woman could have a seizure that could hurt her and the baby. So it's important to try to get the right drug in the first place before you ever get pregnant. In addition, during pregnancy, there's changes in how you absorb the drug, and there's increased elimination of the drug. And this can be quite marked. For example, two drugs we use a lot, Lamotrigine and Levotracetam, they have almost a, they have on average a 200% change in the blood levels. But this is quite bearable across women. It goes all the way from no change to a 400 or 500% change. So the way I approach this is trying to check the levels monthly during the pregnancy and adjusting and staying where they were prior to pregnancy if they were seizure controlled before the pregnancy. So that means it's important to tell your neurologist when you get pregnant so they can monitor that. What are the risks for malformations? In the general population, it's about two to 3%. In old data in the mothers with uh, uh, infants and mothers with epilepsy, it ran about four to 8%. It's really broader than probably about two to 10%. Depends on which drug you're looking at. And the malformations we see typically are heart defects, oral facial clefts, minor skeletal abnormalities, uh, urological problems like uh, absent uh, kidney, and then neurotube defects for two of the drugs, valproate most notably, and to a lesser degree, carbamazepine. Uh, this defect is when the spinal cord doesn't fuse in the back and uh, it's associated with hydrocephalus and cognitive problems and paralysis of the legs, a very, very severe defect. You note up in the right-hand corner, I've listed the North American AED pregnancy registry number, and I encourage women that get pregnant to call this number and enroll in it because it's registries like this and other parts of the world that have really been instrumental in expanding our knowledge about uh, the risk of the antidepressant drugs and pointing out which are high risk and which are low risk. And this is important that we continue to gain this information because there's many of the drugs we don't have enough information for still. Here's kind of a summary of averages across different studies for how what the risk is for major malformations by different anti-convulsant drugs. Valparate's the worst of these at nine to 10%. Phenobarb has an intermediate risk at 67%. Tabiramate has a risk of about four to 5%. Most of those are cleft palates. And then in the intermediate range, we have phenytoin and carbamazepine. And finally, the more safer drugs are, oscaba are uh, oscabazepine, lamotrigine, and levotracetam, which are almost down to the same risk as the general population. It's kind of a complicated slide, but the point of the slide is from a, a large multinational uh, registry called the EURAP, similar to our North American registry, but much larger. And they had such large uh, numbers that they were able, able to look across individual drugs for dose effects. So when you have a drug that causes birth defects, we call that a teratogen, it works, it's dose dependent. So the higher the dose of whatever the teratogen is, the higher the risk. And also there's genetic susceptibility. So, so sometimes at the same dose, different women, may, their babies may or may not get a birth defect based on the genetics. But as the dose goes up, more and more of the group gets, uh, gets birth defects. And this, you can see down at the bottom for valproate, by the time you get over 1,500 milligrams a day, that the risk is about 20, almost 25%. So one in four of the babies are getting major malformation. That's a horrible risk. 
if policy is used lower and lower dose, but there's still probably some risk there, even at low dose FAP rate. What's interesting is that all the drugs that they looked at, these four, only these four, because that's the ones they had the most uh, babies uh, born to, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, phenytoin, and valproate. Even though the risk was lower in other drugs like lamotrigine, the risk is still dose dependent. So we, we try to keep the dose low as we can to protect the baby, but then at the same time, the counteracting uh, rock and hard place is we have to get the, love, the dose up to be able to control the seizures. And sometimes women will get worried about the dose going too high, but it's really the level that's most important. And that's why trying to keep the level near the point of where it was prior to the pregnancy can usually probably is the safest approach. So in terms of malformations, anatomical teratogenicity, I think valproate poses a special risk. It's, it's probably a dose-dependent risk for all the anticonvulsive drugs. Special spinal bifida risk for valproate, especially a little bit for carbamazepine. These are risk factors where it says 12 times, 12.7 times. It means it's 12.7 times above the general population. In terms of malformations, phenobarb and pyramate are kind of in the medium range. And uh, then we have some drugs that are safer, like lamotrigine and levotrastam. Unfortunately, for the risk of most of the drugs uh, and for certain polytherapies, still is uncertain. And we need more information to be able to give better care. In the 1980s, there was a series of interesting investigations that showed that in animals, you could give them a dose of an anticonvulsant drug at a level less than that required to produce a major uh, malformation. But the baby, the animals then would not, when they grew up, would not have the same kind of learning and coordination as uh, animals who were not exposed. So this raised the idea of behavioral teratogenicity, and it's something we really are concerned about. But when you go to, when you used to go look at the literature in humans, it was harder to see this effect because of differences in seizure types, number of seizures, IQ and education of the parents, uh, various drugs used and not randomized. So it became hard to separate all these confounding factors out. So it requires a careful prospective study to be able to look at and follow the kids to a point where you can actually test them in detail to see those effects. So that's how I got interested in this area. And we began a study in 1999. This is phase one of the study. It's called the NEED study. And it's, we followed the kids out testing them at different age. And the ultimate age we tested at was six, because that's a very good predictor of school performance. It's also a very good predictor of adult cognitive abilities. And in that study, what we showed, we had four drugs. Those were the four most commonly used at that time in, church, in uh, university centers. They were carbamazepine, lamotrigine, phenytoin, and valproate. And what we found was that valproate kids on average had seven to 10 IQ points lower than the kids on the other medications. And this is after adjusting for a variety of factors like maternal IQ and a whole bunch of other things that could affect the child's IQ. In addition, we found that other, it wasn't just IQ by itself, it was a whole variety of cognitive effects that were affected by the valproate Verbal IQ was lower for valproate. Nonverbal IQ was lower for valproate. Memory was lower for valproate. And there was, in one of the drugs, it was lower, valproate was lower than lamotrigine for, uh, for executive functions. These are kind of frontal lobe type functions. So it went across a whole variety of cognitive abilities in the children. We also found that this is dose dependent. With, with this is showing that the higher the dose is, the lower these scores were like IQ and verbal IQ and nonverbal abilities and memory and executive functions were all worse for kids that had higher dosages of valproate than lower dosages. We didn't see the same pattern for the other uh, seizure medications. Someone asked, has asked me several times about whether, uh, is there a safe dose? We, that you could give to a woman that wouldn't hurt the baby. Lower dose is certainly safer, but I'm not sure we know what the a safe dose is. In this picture, what you see these little bars, and the top one are children of mothers, of healthy mothers. And you see this kind of typical shape that looks like 
an inverted U shape where it's highest in the middle and then tapers off on both sides. That's a normal uh, distribution you would expect in terms of IQ scores for kids. And then at the very bottom in red, you see children that were exposed to high doses of disavalfrate. These are not that high, it's just over 800 milligrams a day. Uh, so they're not all real, real high. And yet you see a larger number of kids have shifted to the left. They're having lower IQs. And then the group in green is a group of kids exposed to valfrate that was a low dose, less than 800 a day. And you can see it's kind of somewhere in between. So they're, and in fact, that group had significant, statistically significant lowering of the verbal IQ and had a significant increase in need for special education needs. So I'm still concerned even at low dose uh, that, that there's some risk there with that drug. And I really try to avoid this drug if possible, if at all possible. If we can get control of anything else, I try to avoid this drug. Beyond the cognitive effects, there's also behavioral effects. And there's been several studies, most notably this large population-based study in Denmark by Christensen that show there's an increased risk for autism and an increased risk for autism spectrum disorder in children that are exposed to baffling. Another reason to try to avoid baffling if we can. What about some other anticonvulsant drugs? Here's some information from a study that looked at levotrastam, which is Keppra, and topiramate, which is Topamax. And what the study showed for Keppra had some good sized sample. Uh, we want to we're reproducing that to make sure it's true, but they had a pretty good size sample. It was no different. Keppra was no different than the children that had no drug exposure, where you see the valfrate still is lower even in this group. Uh, but the topiramate, the sample size is small, but it also shows no effect. So it's an interesting finding that topiramate shows some increase for malformations, but it doesn't seem to have an, any increased risk uh, for cognitive problems with the babies. This actually goes along with some animal studies that have looked at, at, at drugs in these animal models that show that the effect seems to be somewhat similar to the effect of alcohol and that it, it affects the nerve cells in the immature brain. And we see that with valfrate, we see that with alcohol. Uh, we do not see that with, with levotrastam or topiramate or lamotrigine or carbamazepine. And that may be why we don't see the big cardinal effects that we see with, with valfrate, where, where the effect actually begins on the nerve cells at a level, a low, a level of the, in the blood that's lower than that we used to, we used to treat epilepsy, in fact. One of the interesting findings in our study was that we were controlling for a variety of factors that might interfere with us trying to find a drug difference. And one of the things we looked at is whether women were taking periconceptual folate. This means the folate you're taking at the time you get pregnant and the first month or so of pregnancy. And what we found was, is that children whose mothers were taking periconceptual folate were smarter. Oh, average about six IQ points smarter. That's a sizable number of IQ points. I'd like to have six IQ points more myself. And the CDC recommends that women take folate, um, periconceptual folate, because it reduces neurotube defects and reduces malformations. But now there's an increasing data that taking periconceptual folate is particularly important for cognition and particularly in women who are taking anticonvulsant drugs. Just this year, with some data published supporting our finding from Norway, it was a big population-based study in Norway, and they published two papers. One showed that taking periconceptual folate uh, reduces risk for language delay, and the other one showed that it reduces the risk for autism traits. So there's something special about that folate in the first, at the beginning of the pregnancy is helping protect the babies that are exposed to anticonvulsant drugs. By the way, these, these Norway studies did not have very much uh, valparate in it because it came after we found the bad effects of valparate and the use had dropped in Norway at the time that these babies uh, were being born. And so I think it's very important that women pay attention to taking periconceptual folate the dosage may be a little bit different for certain drugs. I give a little bit more folate for, uh, for the enzyme inducers, for the motrogen, and for valparate. And it's important that we do this way ahead and plan ahead. The reason that is is because half of pregnancies are not planned. 
they may not be unwanted, that half of them are not planned whether they're wanted or not. And so if you wait till you decide you're going to plan to get pregnant before you start taking your periconception fully, you miss the opportunity to get the best outcome you can with the baby. So I encourage all my women that come to my clinic to take the folate and take it regularly. I tell them, take it, you go through menopause, get a hysterectomy, or your husband gets a vasectomy. When you can no longer get pregnant, then it's okay to quit taking the folate. But it, as long as there's a possibility, keep taking it just in case, because it's, it's innocuous, it doesn't hurt anything, you just take it with your, at the same time you're taking anticonvulsive drug, and it will help protect your baby if you get pregnant. So what can we include about behavioral teratinism? I think the study suggests that Valparate poses a special risk for both behavioral as well as anatomical risk. The reasons for individual variability are not clear and the risk of many drugs remain uncertain, but women with epilepsy should be taken fully regularly. They also should try to well before the pregnancy decide which drug is best and try to get on monotherapy if they can and try to use one of the safer drugs that we know are safer if possible. There are many known positive effects about breastfeeding. I get asked all the time about breastfeeding and, and when you're taking anticonvulsive drugs. And in the general population, it's, it's completely accepted that there's reduced risk in the child from in respiratory infections, dermatitis, asthma, ear infections, stomach problems, obesity and diabetes and leukemia, SIDS, and even maybe even cognition. And in the mother, there's positive effects too of breastfeeding reduction in diabetes, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and postpartum depression. So there, there are many positive reasons to breastfeed. Are there negative effects of taking anticonvulsant drugs? Well, with the, and the concept would be that if you were taking the, the baby's already born, so it's not going to get a malformation, but could breastfeeding get the medicine through the breast milk make the baby not be as normal in terms of cognition of behavior? In the general population, there's some evidence that uh, breastfeeding may even enhance cognition. And, but in, there's two studies at three years of age. One is our study and one was a, a Norwegian study. Uh, and what they found was that there was no difference at three years of age. However, uh, by six years of age, we actually saw positive effects. The, the mothers who were breastfeeding, their babies on average had four IQ points higher performance than the other children. So I strongly recommend breastfeeding if a woman wants to breastfeed and can breastfeed, because I think it's gonna be good. Our new study shows that the blood levels are actually quite low in the babies. And that's probably why there's no adverse effect. Even if the baby's taking a, one of the bad drugs like Valparate, even with Valparate, we didn't see any harm of breastfeeding. So what are the cl clinical implications of what I've been talking about today? Again, most children born to women with epilepsy are normal, and a woman should not feel like she can't have a child if she has epilepsy, even if she's on the anticonvulsive drugs. Um, all women of childbearing potential with epilepsy should be taken folate on a regular basis daily. Uh, I think women, one of the things that happens is sometimes women don't get uh, correct informed consent. They don't get this information about all the risks prior to conception. It's very important. If your doctor's not giving you that uh, information prior to conception, you need to see another doctor. You need to have this information to make the best choice and get on the right medicine way ahead of the pregnancy. I think Valvrate's a poor choice for most women with childbearing potential, but if it has to be used because everything else fails, then the dose should be kept as low as possible. I think breastfeeding is safe, and, and not only safe, I think it's beneficial and encourage it. And again, there's still more information we need to learn about other drugs. So uh, one point I didn't make here that I should have is that it's, it's best to try to get seizure control before you get pregnant. Because if women are seizure free for nine months before they get pregnant, they have an 85, 90% chance of staying seizure free during the pregnancy. So it's good to work on that and get the seizure control under uh, best as you can and, and, and to under a drug that we know is as safe as we can prior to the pregnancy to improve the outcomes. This is our new study that's still ongoing. It's called the MoNeed study because now we're looking more not just at child outcomes but maternal outcomes. And we've completed our enrollment. We have about uh, a total of uh, 
550 something women. So most of them have epilepsy and are pregnant. Some of them, there's a smaller group that have epilepsy and are not pregnant for comparison. And then there's a group of healthy pregnant women there too. We're looking at seizure outcomes, OB complications, depression, and then a variety of developmental outcomes in the babies as well as also trying to understand the pharmacokinetics. That means what happens to the blood levels during the pregnancy. And I can share with you a little bit of our, our uh, initial findings. Uh, most of this will get published over the next year. We found that postpartum depression is more common in pregnant women with epilepsy more than healthy pregnant women. And, and the depression is more, more than in women that are, have epilepsy and are not pregnant. Uh, many of the anti drugs have lowering their blood levels during pregnancy, but it's quite variable across women. And we're trying to understand what, why that is, and there, what genetic factors make differences across women in this regard. We did not find OB complications were increased during pregnancy in women with epilepsy, and uh, C-sections were rare. And this is in, is, is in contradistinction to some other studies that said women with epilepsy have about a 1.5 chance risk of getting more C-sections. I think some of those women may be getting C-sections for the wrong reason, just because they have epilepsy and not because they need a C-section necessarily. Overall, we didn't see any increased risk for neonatal problems. However, there are maybe some for some drugs like Depiramate, appear some other larger studies to show a risk for small for gestational AIDS. Um, in addition, as I mentioned earlier, one of the striking early findings we have is that uh, blood levels are low in uh, children who are nursing even when the mothers are taking antibiotic any epilepsy drugs. I think they just don't take as much in and then metabolize it out faster so the levels are quite low and probably have no effect on the child at all. I'm going to stop there and take questions. Thank you very much. So much, Dr. Mutter. We're now going to begin answering the questions submitted during the presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions to the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen or through the comment section on Facebook um, or in the chat box on the webinar. Um, so our first question is, how many milligrams of folate should you take? That's an excellent question. And it's one we don't have the full answer for. For women without epilepsy, the CDC recommends 0 0.4 milligrams per day. That's about this amount that's in all multivitamins. In Europe, they recommended one milligram. So why do we have 0 0.4 and they have one? I don't know, and I couldn't find an answer to that, and it's not clear. Now, then in addition, in women with epilepsy, some of the medicines mess with the folate. The enzyme inducers may lower the folate levels, and valproate may interfere with folate. So we need a little bit more. But what I would say is on average, I kind of give women about 1.4. I give them a milligram of folate. Women with epilepsy, I suggest 1.4. I give them a milligram of folate, and then I have them take a multivitamin, so that's 1.4. Sometimes I give a bit more, especially if there's any family history of spina bifida or birth defects, I may go up to four milligrams per day. I don't go over five because there's some suggested healthy uh, women that uh, that taking over five may cause some problems. So somewhere between one and four is the answer, I think. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, how do I talk to my epilepsy doctor about wanting to get pregnant? Well, if you're seeing an epilepsy doctor and you're taking an anti drug, they should have already talked to you. But if they haven't, you either write them on, if you have a, a messaging system like we have here for my help, you write them on that system or you talk to them at your very next uh, visit. But if your next visit is way away and you're thinking about getting pregnant right now, you better call them up and talk to them right away about it. Um, you should not be in any way uh, hesitant or shy or embarrassed about talking about pregnancy. It's very important that you get all these things straighten your mind so you can make good decisions well before the pregnancy. Like I said before, we want to try to get you on the best safe drug we can, the lowest dose in one drug if we can, get you on periconceptual folate, and uh, to increase your chances of having a really healthy baby. 
Thank you. The next question is, is there research on a pregnant woman taking OMFI and its side effects? There's not enough data on OMFI at this point. There's a very small report from India that they were taking a bunch of other drugs that suggest maybe there was a risk for malformations. We don't have any cognitive data out for OMFI at this point. We don't even have it tested in animals to uh, see if there's markers in the animal models to suggest for that. So it's, it's one of that group where we don't have good information. I can tell you every day, one of the reasons I push this research is every, every week when I'm in clinic, I, I will see some woman come in who's, um, we've gone through the drugs that we know are safe, like levotrastam, Keppra, Lamotrigine, Lamictal, Oscadazepine, Traleptol, Carbamazepine, Tegretol, or Carbitrol, and, uh, and, and then we try to avoid the ones we know that have higher risk, there's a whole group of other drugs for which we don't have information. Alpha is one of those group, one of those drugs in that group. There's several others that I use regularly, like zonisamide and bimpat, that are other ones where we don't have enough information, but sometimes we're forced to use those medications. We're hoping our monine study as the kids grow older will give us some information, but it's going to require several different centers, I mean several different studies to completely answer this. But we're on the right track of trying to get more and more information as we go along, and hopefully we'll have more information within a few years. Thank you. Uh, the next question is about how many medications someone can be on uh, if they're getting pregnant, and this is from someone who's currently on four different medications. Right. The risk we appears to go up is you get more and more drugs involved. We don't know, I don't think all polytherapies are equal. There's some literature from uh, Australia, for example, showing that polytherapies without valparate did not appear to have a major increase in risk. So we don't know for sure about uh, what variety of different mixtures of drugs are in that regard. We have felt, we've seen some women trying to avoid valparate and they've had to use polytherapy to get around and try to avoid that. The risk is higher there with multiple drugs. It still would be possible, but you have to understand there is some increased risk. You can reduce those any, especially for the, reduce any of the ones that we know are in the higher risk group, that would be good. Um, I did have a question, I did have a inquiry some years ago from a young woman who very much wanted to have a child and uh, but she was taking six medications and some of them were medications with high risk. And one of the things I said to her is it's possible to have a surrogate mother in this day and age as a way to have a child. Of course, you could always adopt, but if she really wanted to have a child with uh, genetically hers and her husband, that's another possibility in the modern world today because it's any, all the drugs you're taking now do not increase your risk later. It doesn't increase the risk to your ovary if the ovary is, is, is fertilized and grows outside of, of all that drug exposure, the child would not have increased risk. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, do you have any recommendations for holding your baby if you're worried about seizures? Uh, another good question. Um, when, after the baby comes, one of the things that I talk to women about, I talk to them during the pregnancy about this, not, not after the baby comes, but I talk to them before that to plan ahead, is that um, you may be sleep deprived after the baby comes and we have to pay attention to that, get some help from the family. Maybe if you're going to breastfeed, maybe you, you pump and they feed that later or you supplement with bottle at night and somebody in the family other than the mom's always getting up. Somebody else is trying to help out so the mother's protecting herself in terms of sleep deprivation. Um, and that's why sometimes I leave the level of, of the medicine in the mother's blood a little bit higher than I do before the pregnancy. But what I tell them for safety issues, and because it is an area we're not completely sure, and especially I do this if women are still actively having like jerks from, from uh, doing a myoclonic epilepsy or something like that. I tell them, don't carry the babies around just in your hands. Wear, use them, a sling uh, to walk around with them or use the umbrella stroller, the little umbrella strollers, fold it out, scoot the baby all around the house in that, and then take them out and play with them on the floor or on the bed. And, and to reduce this risk from, from, uh, from the seizure. Another important safety thing is not to bathe the baby by yourself. 
unless you're doing something like put them on the bed and got a wet rag and you're just going to wash them that way. Never put them in water by themselves. If, if the possibility is that you could have a seizure, you have the seizure, the baby flops over and can drown. So don't not, that's another recommendation. I make them in terms of safety issues. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, um, how can menopause, menopause affect epilepsy? Um, there are some women that have a little bit of exacerbation around menopause and then it settles back down. Uh, some women will actually get better after menopause. One thing to watch out for during menopause is to make sure that your GYN doesn't put you on unopposed estrogen uh, for uh, menopausal symptoms. Because if you take the estrogen, remember that's the one that lowers the seizure threshold, and you're not taking any progesterone with it, then that will lower your seizure threshold. So I saw a lady one time that had been seizure free for 20 years, went through menopause, had some hot flashes, her doctor gave her some estrogen by itself, and then that she had a breakthrough seizure. So um, it sometimes can make uh, seizures a little worse. It's usually not a, a big issue. It depends on how uh, sensitive, how fragile the woman's epilepsy is. By fragile, I mean, is it really well controlled? Is it like, are we just barely getting it controlled? Then those are the ones who can see some problems during that time. But make sure your doctor is not putting your own estrogen by itself because that could be, that could precipitate seizures. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, uh, how can we get a referral to a level four epilepsy center? Your doctor should be willing to refer you to uh, one of the centers. Um, generally, most universities have level four. Most universities have level four epilepsy centers. The big universities do. And um, if your doctor is not willing to refer you, then I encourage you to just look for the ones nearest you and, and to call them and see if you can get there without a referral. It varies by, by uh, center. Uh, some centers are glad to take patients who refer to themselves, others require referral, but your general doctor should refer you. There's something wrong if the general doctor's not willing to refer you. I would say markers for when you need to get referred or when you're not under good seizure control, you've tried several medicines, irrespective of pregnancy issues, that's the time to think about getting a second opinion, getting referral. Um, if you're thinking about pregnancy and you're not getting good information about it, that's another good time to ask for referral. I, I told my patients that they ask me to refer them for a second opinion, it never hurts my feeling. There's something wrong with your doctor if, if, you, if you ask for a second opinion or, or for a referral and they don't want to refer you, there's something wrong there. So maybe you need to get a new doctor. Thank you. The next question is, in addition to progesterone lozenges, are there any other medication recommendations for those with catamenial uh, epilepsy? Yes, it has, I'll, I'll talk about the, the uh, progesterone first. There was a study with uh, progesterone lozenges that seemed to work for the catamenial epilepsy that happened right before uh, pregnancy. I have seen some women that got, and it seems like it needs to be the natural progesterone it's, it's not a consistent response to the synthetic progesterone, but I have seen some women that got progesterone uh, injections that seem to help. It's, it's, it's variable. That part's variable across women. Beyond that, if those don't work and they're kind of cumbersome, you have to get them made up, uh, there, there are some long acting uh, progesterones, synthetic progesterones now that could be used too. But beyond the progesterone approach, uh, sometimes if we will use uh, some like filler medication shortly over that time, like um, maybe a benzodiazepine that as a kind of a rescue med or a protecting med during that time. Uh, I work hard to see if I can adjust the background meds also to see if I can get complete control. If there's not complete control, another thing to do well for the pregnancy is think about are there other options? Should I be evaluated to see if there's uh, epilepsy surgery or stimulation therapies that can be done to try to stop the seizures. And so those are things that are great to think about well ahead of pregnancy, maybe get control for that, like the question about the polytherapy, that person is on polytherapy, think about pregnancy, should get a, a, a referral to a tertiary center 
and, and, and asked, are there other options that I can get control and reduce down some of these medicines to make it safer for the baby? Thank you. The next question is, what is the difference between folic acid and folate? They're the same thing, just different terms that we use. Perfect, thank you. Sorry, I should have um, earlier because it is, does get confusing sometimes for people. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, why do the side effects of lamictal increase during my menstrual cycle? Oh, that's because, uh, well, and that's without birth control pills, I guess. If you were taking birth control pills, it would make sense because the birth control pills would lower the level during the regular part of the month. And then when you had the period, you're taking the placebo pills and the level bounces up during the period. So if you're taking birth control pills, that's completely unex completely explainable. It's not as explainable if you're not taking birth control pills. Um, and I would probably see if you can get your doctor to check the level when you're during the period and not during the period, see if there's some kind of major fluctuation that is occurring there. And maybe they could think about an adjustment of the dose to try to avoid that toxicity during the uh, period if it's going up. The same is true whether you're taking birth control pills or not. You could, you could check that and think about adjusting the dose to try to keep it high enough during the uh, uh, non-period time and, and, but not too high during the period time. Another option is to think about using an extended release drug. They don't get quite as high a peak and sometimes that'll improve tolerability for people using extended release. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, um, if a woman is already pregnant and she has drug-resistant epilepsy, uh, what should she do? What can she do? You are, I, I got the part she's already pregnant. I missed the second part of the sentence. Um, and she has drug-resistant epilepsy. Oh, okay. So you're pregnant now and you got drug-resistant epilepsy. I think that's really a woman that should be seeing a tertiary specialist, people that deal with pregnancy and epilepsy all the time. It depends on what kind of seizures you're having. If you're having convulsions, those have got to get under control for both the mother's safety and the baby's safety. If you're having just what we used to call simple partial that now we call focal aware seizures, that's just a little feelings or small jerks, I wouldn't worry too much about those. Uh, they're not going to hurt the baby. They probably won't hurt the mother at all. Um, and those are not critical to get under control. If they're what we used to call complex partial seizures that we now call focal impaired awareness seizure, where you're losing awareness or confusion, and that's then, uh, of course, you shouldn't be driving. Those are also not dangerous for the baby, but depending on how often they're happening, can be worse. And it also can be a marker that maybe you're going to that in both the uh, focal aware seeds can be markers that may be at risk for the complex partial. So the way I approach that is to try to think about maximizing the levels, make sure the pregnancy didn't change the levels, make sure they're okay, think about whether there's any other drugs that might be safer. I don't like changing the medicines in midstream, except when the mother's having seizures that I need to get under control, and then I will consider changing the medicines in that, in that state, but it's very dependent on what type of epilepsy the woman's having, uh, focal versus generalized, what type of seizures they're having within those groups, what medications they're on, what medications they've failed. So all those things have to be taken into account to make a good decision in that regard. Thank you. Um, these are, I think these are all of the questions that we had come in. Uh, Dr. Renner, did you have anything else you would like to add before we end for the evening? Um, only that I, you want to empower yourself to know what's going on. You want to get good information. On the web, there's a lot of bad information out there. Good websites include epilepsy.com, WebMD, the Mayo Clinic website. Those are good websites that you can depend on and be sure what information is there. Don't ever be afraid to ask to get a second opinion or get referred to a tertiary center. And she not, I remember my mom one time, she came, this has nothing to do with pregnancy, but she said, 
I don't like my doctor very much. I said, well, why are you still seeing him? Go see a new doctor. <laughs> if you don't like your doctor or if your doctor's not doing a good job, if you're not sure, get another opinion um, and, and, and make sure that everything's being done right. Thank you. Um, and thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, everyone, for attending this evening's webinar. And thank you so much, Dr. Metter, for your presentation and answering all of the questions. Um, everyone will receive a follow up email with a link to view the recording. Neuropace is the sponsor of this webinar series. You can find more information on a treatment option for drug resistant epilepsy at neuropace.com. This concludes this evening's webinar. On behalf of Neuropace, the Epilepsy Foundation of Northern California, and Dr. Mutter, thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your evening.